everybody to this uh, to this second webinar in 2021 related to open data space and to data ecosystems. Today we have proposed to focus very much on how hospitals are driving their own revolution uh, and taking into account this new change of paradigm where being able for the hospital to open up to a wider ecosystem and to, to focus on data becomes the main, uh, one of the main priorities of the hospital. Two projects uh, in which ATEL is actively participating are supporting this project. The first one is Interoperate. The second one is OpenDI. Uh, and within OpenDI, we, we just have welcomed two new projects which are uh, working with hospitals in order to develop uh, uh, projects based on artificial intelligence. And both our two speakers are, part, are each part of one of those two projects. We will today focus on health data space and ecosystems, but actually the, the ETEL Imagining 2029 29 work program is made of three different TEMA. Uh, aside from this one, we have a TEMA uh, which we developed around hybrid care and new methods of care. This, uh, in, uh for which we had already one webinar this year we have another one and finally the mind the gap uh thematic is more related to issues which which remain very important and are sometimes uh, a bit uh forgotten uh for for more trendy stuff i would say but it's nice to come back to them and to see how we can support them we we will have a third one at the end of the year and we will finish the year uh, with a symposium, we which of course explore further this thema. And the last uh, webinar on this thema will be on on the reference architecture in the health sector, uh, following a work which is being done with a number of large scale pilots uh, in the health sector. So the agenda today is uh, we have two uh, absolutely outstanding presenters today: Philippe Cole from the CHU of Liège and Arnaud Valls from the Hospital San, uh, San Juan de Deu in Spain. Uh, we, we will then have a, a discussion which will, which will be moderated by my colleague Tino. And finally, we try to come with a number of uh, conclusions together. What do we want to do today, actually? We, we have all the speakers trying to reflect on how uh, data-intensive healthcare organizations are developing uh, today. Uh, strategies to capture data from different sources and, and, and how do they exploit them to improve, first of all, their own objective, of course, but maybe also some wider societal objective or participating, of course, to research as some of them are university hospitals. And, but also reflect on uh, the challenges, just the, the organizational, technical and human uh, challenges that they encounter and uh, how and at which condition they can open up their information system to new sources of data and knowledge. When we look at the short-term and long-term internal and external strategies that organizations like hospitals can uh, do develop, we see different trends. And actually the first one is internally, how can I make the best use of my HR? Can I basically scale up with the HR that I have as a hospital or must I change it? And will this change will guarantee an optimal use? And also, uh, will it come with all the tools necessary in order to make this data reuse for multiple purposes uh, possible? Now, hospitals, some hospitals have uh, also understood that they had to widen up and to have in there not under their control, but in their ecosystem, if I can say so, uh, other hospitals. And some hospitals have developed strategy where they use their IT product, not to sell it, but at least to propose it to the, to the other hospital, because in this way, they have already an infrastructure, an IT infrastructure integrated one, where they have access to a wide uh, amount of data, and they can then together uh, cooperate uh, to, to develop that. Others uh, have different approaches and uh, try to develop an infrastructure, an infrastructure which is attractive with nice services 
and so on in order to attract uh, the different organizations and so that they, they come and accept to share the data and possibly then uh, reuse them. Some others are developing more uh, collaboration around uh, projects and specific use cases, while others are also trying to, uh, we see a number of hospitals, for example, in a specific region, who set up a specific, uh, uh, or decide to have a global governance together, sign contracts, and uh, decide to share data together based on standards driven. And it goes beyond, of course, the regional, nat the national infrastructure for continue of care, continue of care, which is already existing, as the purpose is to go much further in that. And finally, uh, many are today, sometimes under the pressure of the legislation or the regulators, uh, obliged now to constitute ecosystem on, ge on geographical level, locally or regionally, and based on new type of contractualization. Now, we all know this is not an easy story, and I, I just took this slide. <laughs> You don't have the name of the person who, who wrote it, but basically somebody is using, as you can see, uh, a very uh, well-known software, a uh, very sophisticated one, and we're just uh, saying that, well, uh, that's a tremendous tool, but a tool which has been built, first of all, to, uh, to, to, to make a financial optimization, and which has driven a lot, a lot of frustrations from uh, the people who use it. So uh, it's just here to express that indeed we need to reflect on all those challenges. It's not only about technology, but it's much more than that uh, when we want to refocus on our attention on data. So without further delay, I would like to start with our first presenter, uh, Philippe Cole, uh, from the CHU of Liège. And Philippe has a, has, a, has a tremendous career. <laughs> I won't take uh, 10 minutes uh, to present him. He's, he's now a recent member of the, the Belgian Academy of Medicine. Uh, he has been, uh, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a doctor, he's a surgeon. Uh, he's also leading the destiny of the information system, the, the Sachs of Liège, since many, many, many years. He is also a teacher at the University of Liège. Philippe, uh, it's the list is really too long. So you you have an incredible interface, I would say, not only uh, in terms of sciences, uh, but also in terms of uh, of uh, interaction with stakeholders, and also geographically, because you've been you've been working in the states uh, for a number of years. So I would say, we with you today, we have the chance to have a, a vision which is really forged. Uh, into a reality and a wide one. So the floor is here. So, so thank you very much uh, for asking me to do this, this presentation today. So I will walk through what we've been doing for the last uh, 15 years or more in our uh, university hospital in Liège. So the uh, university hospital of Liège, you can, you can go, go on so we, show, we see the old parameters here. Uh, it's an academic hospital with about uh, more than a thousand beds and about 5,500 members with activities spread over eight locations, including four hospitalization sites. I think it's important to, to remember that when looking at the, the, the deployment of an electronic patient record uh, and how it can help a hospital with multi-site activities. And so since about now uh, more than 15 years, 17 years actually, we have launched an electronic patient record, including medical, nursing, paramedical information, and also a complete imaging system. And it allows us uh, exchange of data inside and outside the hospital, ensuring an optimal continuity of hospital care and also uh, various type of extramural care. And so we have, uh, uh, I will not go into all details, but most of our functionalities, most functionalities that you expect in an electronic patient record are fully implemented. We started with the most simple where physicians and nurses uh, have access but are not implementing data uh, to uh, more complex functionalities, such as, for example, 
prescription of blood products, prescription of uh, medicine, uh, or uh, also a fully integrated uh, drug uh, circuit. And you probably are familiar with the MRAM model of HIMSS, uh, electronic medical record adoption model, uh, which is a, a system which I found very interesting uh, that actually uh, evaluate the maturity of your electronic medical record according to various criteria from zero to seven, seven being the highest level of maturity. And next, if you click one more, you will see that we are at level six. We obtain or achieve this level in November 2016, so about four and a half years ago, we would need to go through a recertification process as it is given for three, four years. With the COVID uh, crisis, we delayed that a little bit. And uh, we were the first hospital in Wallonia and the second in Belgium after the use of Brussels to, to reach this level. I, I believe since, since then, the University Hospital of Leuven has reached also uh, level six. There are a few hospitals in Europe that have reached level seven. I happen also to be an inspector for HIMSS, and I've been uh, visiting various hospitals, for example, in the Middle East, in, in Saudi Arabia, where they have reached uh, level seven. And it's actually very interesting to see not only how the uh, uh, various functionalities are integrated, but also uh, the use of data from the data warehouse. So for what benefit do you, do you have an electronic patient record? Well, there are various benefits that are listed on, on this slide. So it's a quick access to patient record in one place, making it easier to consider all aspects of a patient condition. Next, it's uh, always available, up-to-date patient-related information. You don't uh, have to worry about the fact that maybe the patient was seen in another department or in another location and you don't have everything. The possibility of securely sharing information with patients and care providers. Uh, then streamline coding and billing. That's very important because at the end of the day, you know, every hospital is a company and we need to be financed. And in Belgium, especially academic hospitals, we need to uh, run a surplus, so we able to invest in, in future projects, being in IT or in other sectors. It also decreased paperwork, and since the beginning of the project, we decided to go paperless. We have been paperless since about 2009-2010. It also uh, has other benefits, such as online appointment, online bill payments progressively, prescription refill request, and sometimes uh, even data uh, up-to-date, update capabilities, for example. Next, uh, you help physician to reach the correct diagnosis and to prescribe more accurately. And so there, I, mean, I think I will go back to that in a minute. The next step of an electronic patient record when you reach level six and especially level seven is a clinical decision support system. And you also reduce duplication of testing because when you remember when I was a resident in surgery, I'm a cardiovascular surgeon by training. Sometimes I wonder, you know, having seen 30 patients in the morning, well, did I yesterday prescribe a chest X-ray or cardiac echo for that particular patient? Uh, with, with a system, you just have to check and you usually you see that the patient uh, has the appointment, for example, or that actually the exam maybe is already done. So, uh, to reach level six, you need that to have for all functionalities in at least 50% uh, of beds. And you need two specific uh, functionalities, clinical decision support system and closed loop medication administration. Clinical decision support system uh, link health observations to clinical knowledge. So what you observe for a particular patient what are, what are uh, laboratory values, imaging values, data entered into the system, and, and these are linked with protocols, with outside guidelines or whatever. Here an example of a pneumonia severity index of fine score, which estimates 
uh, mortality for adult patients with community acquired pneumonia and very rapidly you fill a few parameters and you know in that particular case uh, the, the risk of death for example. There are also numerous other examples from example TIMI scores for patients with acute chest pain and who are developing myocardial infarction in the, operate, in the emergency room and whether they would need a cath lab right away or whether it can be postponed, for example, within 24 hours or linked to, to ESC guidelines, for example, guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology. So the second part after clinical decision support system is closed loop medication administration. Uh, we developed that first for uh, blood product administration and then progressively for a few units, not, not the majority of hospitals yet, it's quite challenging uh, drug administration. So we have two robots. It's actually on, on the size, we, we need three uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and these pharmacy robots are uh, driven uh, they are, yeah, they are driven by electronic prescription on one end, and also drug inventory management system because you know that you can only uh, prescribe what you have in the hospital, obviously what is available. It will link uh, the the order uh, with prescription, and then each medic medicinal product is individually uh, identified by the robot. And so it's linked to the computerized prescription. It's linked to what's available in the system, as I said. But there, then each drug uh, in the blister, there is a, a bear code. And the bear code, uh, there is an, an association with the patient identity, the drug dosage, the drug administration route, and the time. So, uh, we also have automated medicine cabinets linked to the computerized prescription of drugs and only issue prescription drugs. I mean, obviously, the nurse can enter into the system using a code if, if there is a, an emergency, what you, call a, what you call a code in the uh, American system, uh, because if, in that case, there probably will be no uh, prescription and then it's prescribed later. I think this system is also a link, obviously, with the clinical decision support system because you link uh, the identity of the patient and the drug that's administered with the type, the dose, the route. In the prescription, what are the possibilities? Interaction between drugs. So, for example, I want to prescribe a beta blocking agent. Uh, for that particular patient, but there is already a diuretic, so maybe there is an interaction. Obviously, as a physician, I can push, I can say, I want to do it, but I think it's important to get the warning, especially when you work in an academic hospital with a lot, long, a lot of young physicians of residents. Or there is an incompatibility between the drug and the patient, the sex, the age, the condition of the patient, or an allergy, well-known allergy to penicillin, for example, or lab results. I want to prescribe that, but the, uh, there is a renal insufficiency and the system will say, be careful, okay, I go ahead, but maybe I will reduce the dose. Or uh, warning against exceeding the authorized dose, the daily dose, the typical example is paracetamol, uh, which you cannot take more than five grams a day. So I really think that the clinical decision support system and the CLMA, the closed loop medication administration, are part of your future of electronic patient record. And when you when you decide, for example, to change your electronic patient record, these are functionalities that you really need to think. Now we also have access to online appointment booking. I think it's quite basic. There is nothing simple there. It's just a, a shift also. In, in the way people work and they, they, they book their hotel, they book their travel, there's no reason why they couldn't book, uh, at least for younger people, their medical appointment online with some restriction. We have an access also to the imaging portal. We have a strong authentication system. So you need to use, for example, your Belgian ID or It's Me. And we, you, we cannot access just to a, a link without strong authentication because we think uh, there is a risk there. Mm -hmm. 
numerous of you, probably at least people in Belgium, know about the uh, Walloon Regional Network. Uh, it allows an exchange of computerized health documents between healthcare providers working for the same patient. So all healthcare providers involved in this situation will have access to the information about themselves also. The patient has also access. And the last line is key. In order for a healthcare provider to have access to the patient health data, there must be a therapeutic link. So the patient has to give a therapeutic link either to a full hospital, which we do here, or to a particular physician, for example, an extra hospital specialist or a GP, okay? So I think this, is, this system uh, is very important. So you have to understand that all the data remain on the hospital server or on the GP server. They are not, there is not a centralized process like, for example, they try to do in France, where they try to have a, a centralized electronic patient record, which is very complicated. So here, all the data remain in the hospital. What is centralized is actually on the, on the server, okay? It's, uh, it's an index where you can point according to, a, a, to the authorization to various information. But it's very helpful if I see a patient in this hospital, for example, and the patient says, I've been seen in that particular hospital. If it's connected to the Walloon Regional Network, I can access information. The problem is mostly, it's only actually uh, PDF information. Eh? That's, that's not data that you can use, that you can insert into your system. This is not the future, but that's already an interesting step in another model, which is called uh, the more a community level system. So having said that, let me move to the use of data. We, in our department, of a specific, uh, dep within our department, a sub-department, which is called Medical Economic Information Department, that actually was created in 2005. And the decision of the board of directors of the hospital at that time was that there should be a physician who should be in charge of that department, of that service. I became CIO a few years later in 2009. And I think it makes perfect sense that the physician is in charge or of data. What are the mission in this department? There is a sector of data analysis. That's my colleague Jessica Jacques. Some of you know her well, and, and thanks to her, she helped me to prepare this slide with all the, this presentation with all the colleagues. There are two main missions of that uh, sector: provide medical data for physicians, for example, that ask it or an, and analyze the big medical economic situation of the hospital and, for example, make a provision of what uh, are activities, the so-called justified activities or justified bets in Belgium will be. You know probably that in Belgium, as in other countries, I think it's the same in Germany, for example, uh, if a patient with a, a patient with a particular diagnosis-related group, a particular DRG, the hospital is financed according to the average natural length of stay. And so the content of the data warehouse is quite rich. We have medical biology information, nuclear medicine, economic data on hospital stay, patient appointment, operating room. I will not read that. All the systems are progressively connected. So it's not only information from the core of the electronic patient record. It's also information from the laboratory information system from the uh, billing system, from the uh, admission, departure, and transfer system, okay? And that's, that's very important because then you can cross-check all information. You can see the number here of tables or fields, some, some are quite large. We also have an electronic an ERP, a repository system for back office, it's uh, SAP. And so you can see here on this slide, that about half of the medical services have at least one ask the, the data, and more than 30% of all demands are related to research activities. So, for example, you have a, a, a physician or head of, of department that want to publish on, a, on something particular, like, for example, our results of outing valve replacement uh, in octogenarians in, in one decade. Well, the scene in my department will pull out all the data, anonymize them, they, they can go into statistical analysis. 
there is so there is a really a research uh, part of that activity also. And so, what are the what data are clinicians interested in? Well, electronic patient records, patient characteristics and whereabouts, invoicing, interestingly also, administrative and medical data, laboratory and medical imaging, which actually you can link with the first line. Uh, sometimes it's it's whereabouts. So, for example, it's well, where are my patients coming from? Where do they live? So then you use the zip code. You can see whether there is a place where you can actually uh, try to increase your patient load, uh, because we, 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 there is obviously some, competi some competition, even though we are moving in Belgium into a, a network of hospitals. Now, a key message when you want to develop a data warehouse is patience. You, you shouldn't say, that from day one you're going to have all functionalities. If you get consultants telling you that, they are probably liars. Because you need to progressively feed the system. The most important in addition of patients is to make sure that the data are correct. I have it with, with Jessica, there are four analysts. These people, they, they really all are, uh, uh, have a master degree and even some have a PhD degrees. Uh, and I think it's very important because physicians and also the direction of the hospital, uh, Julien Compare, our CEO, they need to trust the data. The last thing you want is to have data that you cannot trust. Because sometimes uh, uh, you, you can be in a difficult situation because uh, the activities is not good or because the mortality is too high or, or whatever. There are some, sometimes subtle reasons. And so you can see here how it was progressively developed, or all the data are progressively uh, feeding the system over the last five to seven years. So the success factor, obviously, you need to have a successful uh, uh, EMR experience. You cannot have a data warehouse if you do not have an electronic medical record. You need to define the role. IT is there for data warehouse ETL. Data analysts analyst are specific work. They are there to exploit the clinical data. So you need a close synergy between them. The data analyst must have a scientific background. They must understand what they are doing. I'm not saying IT people cannot get a scientific background, but there's a very specific training. The possibilities depend on the maturity of the EMR. And if you go back to the, don't move, huh? but if, you, if we would go back to the slide with the MRAM level, you would remember that level seven, you need a data warehouse. And you, oh, not only you need a data warehouse, but you also need to use your data warehouse. And what we ask as inspector level seven is the hospital to show us several protocols that they have. And for these protocols to have used, to have analyzed the data for one year and possibly improve their protocols. So uh, let me give you an example where, for example, I don't know, a protocol about prevention of foul in, in the hospital. Well, you look at all the data for at least a year and then you say, OK, let's improve my protocol of foul. Same for septicemia mm -hmm. or, you know, decubitus or say whatever. And the data analysts would have access to the finest data, not necessarily the production data. We have a server which replicate the data every day at midnight. So, but there's a very few hours of difference, but you cannot use the data obviously for from last year or something like that. And as I said, the most important success factor is validate, validate, validation of the data. So a few perspectives to, to conclude, maybe in the late next five or 10 minutes at the most, is dashboard reporting, provision of COVID clinical data, sharing clinical data with pharmaceutical industries, and use of for research. So the first one is, uh, yeah, the dashboard. One example is a focus on oncology. Well, the main, again, for data to be valid, you need to use a correct definition. And for the oncologic patient, what is the source? It can be Belgian Cancer Registry. It can be uh, data that have been coded 
according to what is the electronic medical record, resume hospitalier minimum, minimal hospitalized, minimal hospital summary, or enough from radiotherapy in, in case the patient has received radiotherapy. Determine the date of incidence because normally you consider that after five, year, five years after the last treatment without recurrence, the patient is cured. And then you, so you need to open a five year sliding window take into account recurrence or new cancer. And so here's an example of our dashboard where you can see the number of patients with active cancer, the number of patients being treated, the number of patients with new cancer, different between incident and prevalence, for example. And this is obviously a copy of screen, but in the real system in click view, we can move with year to years to various types of cancer, to bonds, to whatever, and that's an extremely dynamic and useful dashboard. The uh, had to report on uh, on COVID, as you know, in Belgium, to San Seno every, every day. And so we have a dashboard, all patients with COVID are identified. There is a star on that, and they identify into the system. And you have all the information about the age of the patient, about where, in which unit the patient is, for example, about the number of, of circle of the PCR and the highest number of the, the lowest number of circle, the higher the the virus load of the patient is, for example. So again, this dashboard is very interesting. At the peak uh, in in November, the, the highest of the second peak, we reach almost 300 patients uh, concomitantly. So it's a unique database that has been developed around several disciplines with a weekly update for clinical research. You can see the various contents that they are there, whether the patient had symptoms at admission, risk factors, treatment, biological values, ICU data. It has been used by more than 30 researchers in the, throughout 10 disciplines and more than 10 publications for analysis. We are sharing clinical data with pharmaceutical industry. We start to do that. Uh, careful, obviously, and only anonymized data. That's called the INSIGHT, Trinex project. Uh, because there are a lot of challenges to perform clinical trials and pharmaceutical companies, they are looking to identify uh, whether we can provide a certain amount of patients with various characteristics. Uh, for example, uh, if a company deciding to test a new drug for type 2 diabetes, well, they would like to know whether we have uh, the, the patient caseload for that uh, and what are the characteristics of these patients. So inside Empower's Trail Science, it's a platform for trustworthy reuse of electronic health record data uh, to support innovation in clinical research and healthcare operations. Uh, local platform, detailed data exploitation for healthcare professionals. And you can see the various companies such as Astra, Roche, Sanofi, or Janssen that are partners. Uh, I will not go into all details of the technical overview. Uh, obviously, the data remains uh, in the electronic health record. They are uh, uploaded uh, on the data warehouse. There is a local installation of inside, but they only have access to uh, anonymized data. And that's very important because sometimes you can see in the press that hospitals sell their data or whatever. I think that's really we need to fight against false information and, and explain that actually when you when you participate in a project like that, uh, it must be very secure. And also, why do, do we do it? Well, at the end, to improve patient care, because if you participate in trials, uh, trials get results and improve patient care. I think there is no other objective. So in the Inside Partner Hospital Network, so far the 11 countries, uh, 20 million patient record in 2017 and the number of patient record in the network in 19. So it's increasing tremendously. It's a European network project. And finally, uh, and, and it's also, I guess, my, my academic background, I really insist that we participate into European projects, into Belgian projects, into international projects. I think we have the maturity in a hospital to do that. Uh, and, and we, it's also an occasion on this platform, uh, we would favor to participate in other, net, in other research projects to welcome partners. And I think that that really is very exciting. So a few examples, it's, uh, it's an interact project. So it's, it's European, but 
limited to neighboring countries. Uh, in this case, uh, Eurasia Mers Rhine. So here the objective is to develop multi-sensors, wearable, secured, and wireless monitoring system for inpatients from 2018 till the end of this year. And so various parameters are collected, for example, uh, blood pressure, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, uh, water content of the body uh, through a wearable. That's uh, in this we we are here talking about hospitalized patient for the, for the, this this project. We will move to an outpatient project. Uh, wearable could be the jacket, for example, that the patient is using while in the hospital. And so the device here is on the chest. The data is processed. Now you can see I, I listed several of them, blood pressure, heart rate, O2 saturation, uh, breathing rate, also activities and so forth. Uh, so it's quite uh, quite large. And, and why do we, would, would you do that? Well, because these parameters, for example, give you an ID that the patient is entering maybe a fluid overload and will need a diuretic. And instead of having the nurse taking this parameter twice a day, well, the idea is to decrease the workload of the nurses or the paramedics and to feed the system with online data immediately. If you move to uh, outpatient, there obviously that would become very interesting for patients with chronic conditions, such as, for example, COPD or cardiac insufficiency, where the data are sent to the hospital, analyzed, uh, in an automatic way, and then we could maybe prevent the deterioration of a, of a patient with a chronic condition. Uh, second project uh, which the ITEL participated is the uh, it's an Horizon 2020 project, it interoperate, which empower patient to aggregate his or health data and share them during medical visit, emergency, and for research purpose. Uh, Walloon Regional Network, that's great, but that's only in Belgium. And when you travel and during summer period, everybody's excited about traveling uh, at the end of the COVID, or at least at the end of this phase. But if you get sick somewhere, you, I think it's very important to be able to share the data. And also when you come back into the art living environment. And so requirements definition, co-creation of patient healthcare practitioners application, data provider, data conversion rules, clinical validation studies. The, another project is persist, which is the, the aim is to improve the quality of life of cancer survivors with the help of AI and big data. Uh, that started last year and will run till 23. Uh, you can see the various uh, members of the consortium. So here it, it, it's really about patients that will enter their data and also the system will uh, have physical parameters that are automatically connected. The idea here, we are moving into prompts for patient reported outcome, PREM, psychological and physiological data. Uh, home span AI, uh, improving scheduling of radiotherapy appointment using AI chatbot and digital twin. So it just started, uh, ran through three years. It's a Horizon 2020 program. Uh, we have expertise, concept definition, data standardization, and so forth. The Dragon is about uh, an OCO working with OCO radio mix. Uh, the aim is to secure an imaging based diagnosis stratification was developed in the first phase of COVID. I think it's about the end. So it's a multi centric data harmonization development process. It's mainly based on imaging. Well, thank you very much. I hope that I, I raise your interest and, and be happy to field any question that you would have. Again, thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, Philippe. I'm happy now to, to welcome uh, Arnaud Bols uh, from uh, the San Juan de Deu Hospital, Children Hospital, sorry, from Barcelona. And uh, Arnaud Bols has not a medical background, but has also a very, very, very interesting background. He's, uh, He's a telecommunications engineer and uh, he is uh, working as a uh, research and development engineer and uh, three dimension this planning uh, service. And this is, is very much a, a motor in the innovation department of the Hospital San Jose de Deu. So, uh, without further delay, I give you the floor, Arno. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for inviting me here to explain. Uh, what we are doing in 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 our hospital uh, in terms of uh, data and and digitalization. 
um, and what's our strategy. And I will try uh, to go through it very briefly. Um, so uh, as you said, I'm a telecommunication engineer as a background, uh, and I've been specialized in, in um, health uh, IT and working here in the hospital for the last um, seven, seven years. Uh, we had the chance to develop some of the infrastructure that we uh, are using now and I, I will try to explain. So just for you to have a little bit of uh, background uh, from our hospital, uh, for those that don't know, uh, it's a pediatric uh, hospital uh, based in Barcelona and maternity health. It, it, we have uh, 350,000 patients a year more or less. It's one of the biggest uh, in Spain and, and one of the biggest in, in, in Europe. Uh, for pediatric and maternity health. Um, in terms of activity, we are the first uh, in, in Spain. The second is, is in Madrid, is La Fe. And in Europe, we used to be in between the three uh, first. We are a, 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 a private non-for-profit hospital that have a concert uh, with a public uh, service here in, in Catalonia and, and in Spain. Um, and also we have international patients. So uh, now that you know a little bit more about about us. Uh, I will try to uh, explain beginning by what we have, uh, what was the basis of our uh, hospital. We have uh, an infrastructure uh, in which uh, the transactional and the basic uh, is the uh, historical medical uh, healthcare record, sorry. And then we have a, a bus of data that uh, controls the different uh, data systems that are used in each of the hospital setting. So uh, we have a specific EHR established uh, for the ICUs, the, the, PICU, the PICU ICU and the NICU, the neonatal. Uh, but then we also have different systems that, that complement all this, like a patient portal, a uh, data warehouse, um, and uh, also uh, other uh, products for um, uh, the lab, uh, the pathological anatomy, and uh, in the last times, uh, we included also a CRM uh, for all the management of the uh, patients and communications uh, inside and outside outside the hospital. Um, apart from that, which is the core of the of the hospital, with this ensemble bus of integration that have interoperability with, uh, with HL7, a uh, we have uh, contact and transmit data uh, following the directives of the uh, Catalan Health Service. And I don't know if you are familiar in how it works in Spain, but basically each autonomic community have uh, its own uh, way of doing uh, things and legislation in terms of a uh, data sharing. Uh, although there's common uh, um, regulations, but in our case in Cat Salud, which is the public service in Catalonia, uh, we share data through a, a cloud platform that it's called HC3 and that have pointers taking out data, uh, specific data that was specified uh, uh, um, for all the hospitals uh, the same to bring data to this common cloud in which a, a, you can manage and connect uh, prim primary care with uh, uh, tertiary hospitals and, and all the data. Also, we have other platforms like one that was mentioned before in the last presentation with this uh, insight for uh, research in clinical trials or others for monitoring of a, um, uh, a, 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 a surgical cases uh, and patient flow, which is uh, MySphere. And now uh, that you have a base on, on what's in our hospital in terms of data system and data infrastructure, I want to explain uh, what made us uh, do a reflection and 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 move uh, towards a, a, a building of a, a data lake uh, to improve re um, research and, and innovation. And I will try to go to uh, some concrete projects. Basically, that was through a project, a fin financed a European project called uh, Liquid Hospital. Uh, I'm sorry for the slide that is in Spanish. Um, basically, uh, several uh, years ago, and that was. Uh, thought uh, this name because of Sigmund Bauman and, and her uh, proposal of the liquid uh, life in which uh, all is ubiquitous and, and most of uh, healthcare happens outside the space of the hospital. So starting back in 2009, what this project started to think on telemedicine, on bringing patients home um, and make them participate in their health. And that was not only because a change of the world, but because also a, a survival strategy of the hospital uh, the hospital was becoming 
uh, after the crisis of 2007 and 2008, uh, uh, found a reduction in, in, in the concert uh, with the public service. And it decided that it has to move internationally and to more complexity. So that made rethink all the digital and infrastructure strategy of the hospital. Um, so uh, we built this project for uh, uh, from 2005 to uh, today uh, to try to build different platforms that were online to bring patients and connect with them. So um, the, all these platforms that we built, uh, what basically made, uh, I'm talking about a patient portal, I'm talking about a, a open platforms uh, to put together different patients with rare diseases, uh, to find peers with similar uh, conditions and to uh, connect with uh, professionals that could explain um, how to uh, treat the treatment and also use those data for research, for example, or platforms for the management of uh, diabetes type 1 uh, or uh, for metabolic diseases. All these platforms uh, made the hospital increase uh, by a hundred the number of uh, total data points and data connections every day. So if we had uh, 1,000 patients visiting the hospital every day generating data, uh, when we finished this project, that was multiplied by more than 100. So uh, we needed to put some order to this complexity. So we had a complex digital ecosystem and uh, with data si silos, not only inside the hospital with the different uh, a, um, data points like the EHR, the, the electronic health record, the lab uh, uh, data, the anatomical health record, the genomics and everything, but also with data coming from outside the hospital, uh, from these uh, websites, this patient portal and monitoring data uh, from patient homes. So. Uh, we uh, stopped and think on how to simplify and put order to all, all that. Um, that uh, was done through a European project, which is called the Liquid Hospital uh, 4.0 uh, from 2015 and 2019, and with some collaborations from uh, different partners that help on, on this journey. Uh, basically, our objective of this project was first uh, to increase, improve the model of attention and provision of services to ensure a multi-channality. Uh, for that, uh, we created a, a, CRM, a CRM, so we integrated, sorry, a CRM uh, to make this connection and put all the channels uh, of communication uh, through a contact center uh, and with data managing one uh, only system. Uh, improving the patient portal so that we can uh, connect and integrate to the different um, systems of the hospital, gathering data from questionnaires, uh, from monitoring data through uh, a protected uh, channel in which we could also do a, um, a sharing of, of data in a secure way. And then uh, the second one, which is create value from the data. So how we manage to take all this data that we have, not all, but all those data points that are really relevant for uh, the clinical assistance for the operations of the hospital and um, standardize, harmonize, uh, harmonize them and, and put it in a way that then can be reused uh, uh, for uh, taking um, solutions or advancing research and innovation. So the, the, the first was how to put the order from all these uh, repositories of clinical data, bio and omical data, monitoring data and social data. Um, in our case, we have a D per C, uh, H, uh, e -E -H -R, so it's not EPIC or uh, one of those big ones that already have mounted a system for, uh, or some systems for uh, data analytics. In our case, um, we have a, a, an EHR that it made it very difficult to gather all this data and was no space uh, to put it there. So the question was where to put this data. Um, so we decided that the best way would be to, to build a, uh, or integrate a new system, uh, which is a data lake, uh, to integrate all, all these uh, data points of interest uh, in an harmonized way so that we could work then uh, out this data and the, and the developments that, that uh, have to be uh, done. And that was uh, complementing a data warehouse. So we already have uh, a data warehouse in the hospital uh, that is mainly focused for management and control uh, and for improvement of health uh, healthcare processes, uh, counting a number of beds, occupation in emergency department, uh, in hospitalization, 
and external consultancies. Uh, so uh, basically focused on structured data, uh, structured in a way that we can take out some KPIs, some outcomes, some scores, and more focused in operational control uh, management. But we needed another space uh, that let uh, take data not only structured, but also uh, non-structured, non-SQL data a, a for in improving and using data for research and having the secondary use and uh, helping on advance in innovation of, of new solutions. So uh, more focused on um, doing predictive uh, analytics, data discovery more easy because um, most of the problems that we got while uh, trying to uh, look for uh, different patterns in, in data from a clinical point of view or from a research point of view was that uh, the way we had the data organized was not easy uh, to look for longitudinal or big uh, amount of data uh, structured in a way that then can be easy uh, to um, uh, to work with, and 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 most of the of the cases were uh, first studied uh, case by case and really uh, difficult to analyze how to extract data from the different origins to create uh, the database that you then would be using. So we tried to um, rephrase it and try to define first uh, the protocols, the standards, and and the way we want this data organized to try to easy. Uh, the process then of uh, um, uh, uh, doing uh, data extraction and, and, and working with, with data types. Of course, that's really complex and, and it's a work in progress, something in which we are already working uh, and with several um, uh, difficulties in, in the path. And I, I absolutely agree with the previous uh, uh, presentation in that a, the most important thing here is, is, is patience uh, and it's a work in progress. So that that's what we created a, a data lake that we call it health data manager the this uh, is integrated through hl7 uh, to the bus or uh, the data bus of the of the hospital and connected through different uh, origins of data uh, it has uh, atl uh, uh, defined with not only the ehr but also with other uh, origins of data through this bus and it gathers data uh, that is structured and in structured. And then we have uh, uh, a defined protocol inside the HDM for uh, harmonizing this data in different levels from a uh, raw data to a, a more um, um, a standardized and, 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 and that can be queried with a SQL um, uh, language. Uh, this data, data infrastructure, um, it's distributed and, and, and enriched and then we have some uh, components uh, some open source components uh, that uh, build the application layer and this application layer is focused in two main uh, objectives uh, that uh, are some of uh, data querying and, and and data acquisition more for research and the second one more for uh, users that are not familiar with um, a, this kind of languages uh, for for developing uh, solutions and and for querying rapid uh, rapidly uh, the data you need the variables you need uh, in in a in a in a more easy easy way. Um, nowadays uh, we integrated um, more than one million and a half uh, data subjects from different uh, uh, data origins, more than twenty one uh, lab, uh, uh, pharma. Uh, electronic health record uh, and we also have a not all the data inside this system but those data that are really important for uh, for the cases that we want to develop so we keep building it by uh, a, a calendar and a program uh, based on the needs that we we found also we we take a decision on not putting inside this data like the imaging uh, rather than that we have some of the information from the um, from the from the uh, imaging and the packs, and uh, just taking the, the clinical and, and patient data and the imaging, it's just connected by a pointer that in case it's needed, we can import to the, to the data lake. Um, the, the system uh, diagnosis, it's focused and based on ICD-10 and ORFA uh, for orphan diseases, which is something very common in, in, in pediatric care. 
Um, this cloud-based data lake uh, have, as I mentioned before, three main objectives, clinical decision support systems uh, with a, an open source system that helps create dashboards that then uh, can be projected into the uh, a, a transactional um, uh, software that the, the professionals will, will see. Then a second, uh, a second application, which is uh, basically for research, uh, integrating the Jupyter Lab, um, that's separated from the uh, uh, main data point, and, and in that um, yeah, we extract those tables of data that, that we need uh, to do the research and provide space for the researchers for a certain uh, amount of, of time and capacity. And uh, we piloted uh, this in, in two main uh, areas, first in obesity and second in, in diabetes, type 1. But uh, moving to, the, to what I said at the beginning, uh, trying to put some order on the uh, communication uh, and, 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 and data, um, we created this strategy that's called uh, Cortex uh, to improve efficiency, uh, outcomes, and, and patient experience, but that mainly has three parts. A common center that is focused on improving uh, workflows and that takes data from the data warehouse, but also from the uh, data lake and, and some monitoring data. Second, uh, the contact center, which basically works with the Salesforce uh, CRM and, and that basically focus uh, with a team of people trained uh, for that to give and provide answers to the people that uh, contact the hospital from different levels, administrative level or uh, direct contact. And then an e-care uh, part, which is focused on telemedicine, uh, basically, and that we start, uh, start piloting uh, in cardiology and uh, diabetes. Um, that's uh, what we have uh, built. That's how it looks that uh, the telemetry and command center uh, uh, for patient uh, monitoring. On the uh, left side, you can see the operational uh, view here. We have all the people that have to take the decisions uh, at the same place, uh, looking at the data that they need uh, to take the best decision. And that used to be very useful in cases like a uh, uh, autumn and, um, um, and and just a few months, March, February, when uh, normally there's an increase of cases uh, of respiratory diseases uh, into the ICU of the hospital and the emergency department gets uh, really tight. That was something that was really useful also during the, the pandemic uh, um, for doing this monitoring of, of the occupation of different beds and, and the state of, of, of the... But it's still work in progress and is still in an early stage and we want to build uh, uh, it uh, much more to be useful for uh, uh, most of the operational applications of the hospital. Um, one of the examples that I mentioned before, and that's one of the first examples of uh, monitoring and home monitoring, uh, it's the pre-Bengo uh, telemonitoring uh, uh, for obese patients. Uh, that's a project in which a patient with high obesity get into this program in which uh, we provide uh, a Garmin, uh, so a, a monitoring device to patients uh, to monitor their activity. And they enter into a program of seven weeks in which they have a nutritionist, uh, a nurse, and also uh, uh, an endocrinologist that will follow up on their state of life. So they need to monitor uh, daily and once a week, so daily remotely and once a week with a call a teleconference uh, call with, with the patient and the family, how patients are evolving to do a very uh, concentrated uh, um, uh, uh, program uh, to try to improve and change the behavior of, of those patients. So this data, this Garmin data, it's collected uh, and integrated to the data lake and then integrated with other clinical data uh, to uh, provide some dashboards of the evolution of the um, weight and, and, and other uh, data of the patient, like activity, how many steps they do. And this data is also uh, can be seen by the, by the patient that can see how many steps they are doing as a motivational way of, of, of uh, changing their, their way of uh, doing uh, the exercise that are proposed by the clinical team. Um, this is connected to the, the HDM, so the, the data lake in which uh, we also have uh, clinical data from the EHR. So at the end, um, 
we want to go to a, a, a more data-driven healthcare organization without losing uh, all the contact and, and, uh, and uh, 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 proper healthcare delivery that, that we should have. And we think that these uh, platforms that, that we are building with, would help in efficiency uh, uh, and improving the clinical practice, the operations, and also uh, research. But there's um, still many challenges. Um, one of the challenges that we face is in COVID pandemics, how to accelerate innovation and development of research projects. Uh, and we needed a, a safe environment in which we can carry out clinical research and research with third parties in a structured and a standardized way. And uh, as I said, we had insight, but insight is very focused on uh, clinical uh, studies. And uh, for that, what we normally uh, use is REDCap as a data entry system, but we needed a space, a safe space in which to harmonize the data from the different studies that we were developing because most of the variables that the different studies were using were almost the same. So we found that there could be a, an advantage in taking and harmonizing the same way data so that then can be reused uh, uh, for improving uh, the research uh, outcomes. And that's why we created uh, what we call the HDM Open Data Bank. So it's a secure part of the data lake uh, in which um, as in the HDM with the pseudonymized uh, data, uh, but uh, with uh, some levels of uh, and, and, and some applications for uh, extracting uh, and doing a, a proper uh, hash, hashing uh, encryption of data of certain variables, uh, we can uh, share this data also with external uh, entities that they can download in an harmonized way the, the data uh, uh, that we use in, in this research. But also for the internal use, um, all this data, it's harmonized so the, the, the people and the researchers can access the data of their study, but then other studies can be built on top of uh, the, the, all the data collected, of course, and always going through the ethical committees and, and asking for all the uh, uh, permissions that are needed. But basically, that was the, the problem. We had a, a 19 studies. Uh, most of them collecting data through REDCap, but some of them collecting it by Access or Excel even. And there, there was a need of a certain harmonization. Um, so uh, we decided to harmonize and everybody collect data with REDCap, uh, taking all this data to a database that then uh, codifies, uh, harmonize with uh, some uh, bioinformatic that helps on this harmonization and, 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 and data management. And then a um, taking up this data to the uh, uh, HDM, the, the data lake. So um, the result of that, and that's an, an old picture, but a Kids Corona, it's called the research project. Uh, we uh, now have uh, six data sets uh, from pediatric adult and pregnant uh, populations. And the sum of the different data sets made uh, the sum of uh, 17,000 uh, subjects uh, with more than 7,000 PCRs and, and, and more than 4,000 serological samples, which is the sum of the results of, of the different uh, data sets. Um, also, we participate in European uh, projects, and, and with that, we started, and we are very happy to be part of the Accelerate uh, a Smart Hospital Care Pathway Engine uh, European project. That is a project that, uh, together with uh, Haas University in Helsinki, um, uh, Bambino Yesu in Italy, uh, Olu Hospital in the north of, of Finland and many other institutions and research project, uh, uh, research universities. Uh, we are focusing on developing uh, AI-based uh, solutions to optimize hospital processes and improve the quality of patient care. And this project uh, consortium that was led by the Helsinki University Hospital uh, starts now and will end uh, in three years. But uh, said that, uh, we found many barriers in the in the in the process of developing, and I think many barriers are still there. Um, data is still in uh, very heterogeneous in different systems. Uh, there is a lack uh, of a common standard uh, and terminologies uh, throughout uh, the different um, uh, hospitals, even uh, systems, healthcare systems, and 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 interoper interoperability is still uh, scarce and, and difficult. So uh, we think those topics, if we want to move uh, to a unified um, uh, 
uh, system in which you can reshare data, it, uh, there's a long way uh, to, to to move forward. Even in our case, uh, uh, in here in Barcelona, with the closest um, uh, hospitals. Um, there's also we found the fear of change uh, through uh, cloud infrastructure or or with the new GDPR compliance, um, and there's some fear on the cost that it could have on the changes on the implications that it could have um and the uh, and and a fear of of sharing uh, data so uh we found a difficulties in in governance in trustability in security but also at uh, the coexistence of of uh codings and ontologies don't make it easier uh and we found that this dif uh very different uh levels of development uh, if we are talking about genetic uh, or genomic data, or we are talking about uh, imaging, or we are talking about other types of clinical data, and uh, most should be done on that. Um, so, um, one important thing also is that there's new profiles needed, uh, IT, bioinformatics, and mathematicians uh, needed to move all that forward, and it needs a lot of time, a lot of effort, uh, uh, and uh, to put all uh, the stakeholders together to in the hospital to make really uh, move and advance on on, on this field. Uh, not to mention the new uh, regulation for um, medical devices that takes the uh, algorithms uh, development and most of the software as a medical device and, and steps some uh, regulations that must be uh, followed if you want to develop uh, uh, software and um, uh, data solutions for healthcare. So um, thank you very much, and I try to briefly explain what, what where we are and, and the strategy that that we followed without going uh, too much in depth uh, in technicalities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Arnau. Uh, we are really uh, with short time for discussion, but we we wanted to uh, start with a present, uh, reaction from the front row. And we, we have two speakers today, uh, two uh, panelists, uh, uh, Professor Andre Sherek uh, from Jena University and Stefano Darmiani from uh, uh, Fondazione Toscana Gabriele Monasterio. And uh, as you can see, the complexity of the, both presentations in terms of projects and the use of data for different purposes is uh, overwhelming. Uh, but I would like to point out uh, two main directions and actually to to ask the reaction from uh, Professor Sherak and, and Dr. Dalmiani. Uh, uh, first is the connection of data use for research. It looks like research is really a driver of innovation in both hospitals. And I would like to listen from both of you, uh, your views uh, in, in this field. So please maybe, uh, uh, Professor Sherak, uh, would you like to take the floor first? Of course, yeah, I can. And it, that's actually linked to some of the notes that I took during during your inspiring talks. Thanks for the talk so far, and also thanks for the invitation. Sure. Yes, um, we had uh, the meeting of the so-called Medical Informatics Initiative, which is an initiative in all German medical hospitals, uh, yeah, just yesterday. And um, the, the points that were made with regard to IT infrastructure, clinical decision support systems, and so on, were very similar to what you showed here uh, in, in, in Belgium and in France. And um, then the question came up from one of the panelists, and I just repeat this here, how do we integrate uh, information and data uh, from other sources? Let's say we have uh, uh, guidelines or uh, meta-analysis or very high level clinical information from evidence-based medicine, how this how is this put into practice in our hospitals? And that we should be aware that most of the data that we have, even though they might, may, may be valid and they are checked and so on, and you both pointed out that this is important, it, it's still some sort of ob observational data. And uh, of course, uh, we are all uh, in the first stage um, focusing on getting access to the data, getting the data. Uh, however, we might run into several biases later on, and uh, we have to take care of that uh, probably at the moment or in the meanwhile, because otherwise uh, we might corrupt trust in the data, but 
not because they are not valid, just because they're interpreted uh, wrongly. Let's let's put it this way. Yeah, so um, the, the to, just in two words, get this link with uh, with with research is the question of how to get in uh, get information in from other external sources, and to be aware of the limits of the data, even though it might be valid from a data quality point of view, uh, how um, how far we can stretch the information that is extracted from that data. So this is, uh, these are the two points maybe uh, to make it uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Stefano, you, you are involved uh, in the direction of IT in, in your hospital that is also uh, specialized in is thematic in cardiology, but also you participate actively in the project of interoperate. Uh, not necessarily research, but also the use of data to improve operations. We have seen many examples of how, how uh, Liège and, and Hospital Saint Jean de Deu, they are using uh, this secondary use to improve operations. Uh, what, what is your views here? What, what are your reactions to both presentations? Um, well, I've seen a couple of uh, very relevant experience in this uh, because of the, uh, let's say, uh, the huge amount of information that I've seen uh, that uh, both hospitals are managing. Uh, in, in my experience, uh, of course, uh, the pediatric uh, aspects of healthcare is much more complicated uh, because of uh, a huge variance on, on some aspects. Or, uh, especially for clinical decision support system for the lack of some rules or regulation to be applied directly in pediatric uh, field. Uh, I mean, uh, we don't have so many rules to be applied for drug management for pediatric patient but, and uh, as well for some uh, rare diseases. Uh, but uh, of course, each experience is very significant. And uh, here you can see that uh, the vast amount of information they collected, they set up uh, both uh, essentially data lakes. Uh, and in this huge sea, uh, the problem might be, uh, of course, the availability of information that can be uh, somehow uh, accessed by uh, the healthcare researchers, but also uh, let's say the integration, of course, that have to be set up in this, uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the topic of this workshop in this uh, new ecosystem. This cause, talking about ecosystem, we are uh, acknowledging somehow that uh, uh, the system is made up of different subsystems, different entities uh, that have to be integrated. So. The main topic uh, is always in interoperability, which has uh, along the, always the topic of uh, semantic meaning of each information that we are able to collect for patient care, but not only during healthcare processes that have to be uh, somehow remodeled uh, uh, to, um, to be effective uh, uh, for the IT system, uh, uh, to have an, an action, a, a real support, uh, uh, a real, uh, uh, I mean, uh, efficiency, and talking about uh, uh, also economic efficiency, because many uh, complex systems are really expensive. Uh, uh, we cannot afford, uh, uh, for example, the very nice robot that uh, in they are using to package uh, the single dosage dosage for the uh, drugs uh, administration, and uh, I, I'm uh, I'm sure that this is uh, uh, another point that we have to add on the process of healthcare management. So somehow we are try to relate uh, uh, the availability, let's say, of resource and the capability, technological capability that is nowadays very high, uh, and that. Uh, can be uh, somehow uh, a, a, an element uh, that can be used uh, in different uh, situations. We can apply the same technology. I mean, the ETL technology to extract information can be applied in different domains, in different contexts, but it's always the same uh, technology. And this is uh, uh, the final point uh, for the real world data. 
evidence because uh, if we are pointing on having uh, some uh, information I'm not talking about uh, an, uh, an effortless uh, uh, amount of information because uh, we have always to produce some effort to collect information from the patient but uh, I mean we can enlarge uh, we can uh, uh, have a better patient engagement, which means uh, uh, an higher enrollment for the clinical study uh, needs to be uh, enhanced, of course, by some other information that uh, the clinical study needs to collect uh, because not every information can be extracted by real world evidence. Uh, many times we need to enrich to enhance uh, the real world data with something that I need as, as a physician to collect for, for my study. But this is a huge step forward. And this is something that uh, is, uh, uh, is deployable in different uh, healthcare systems. Uh, we are talking about uh, here different nations. And uh, according to, of course, different regulation, we might try to uh, do the same things uh, and to support uh, these uh, data lakes uh, across different nations. And uh, uh, lately, even a few initiatives uh, have been started to adopt uh, somehow this concept of uh, data lakes or, or across, uh, across, across different nations. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something that I feel uh, the need uh, to stress uh, uh, in, in different uh, uh, projects as well, just like the Interpret project that we are managing right now. Thank you, Stefano. I think this is actually uh, uh, one of the big, biggest challenges because we can see how the complexity of data uh, within the hospital is growing, but also the need of connection with other healthcare providers. We have seen the two experience of uh, connecting information or data uh, in national networks and, and to improve integrated care with uh, other levels of care, uh, but also that these new sources of data, mobile health, patient generated data. And here I would like to invite both speakers <clears throat> maybe to reflect a little bit about these challenges. Uh, you, are, you are growing. Uh, you are making more complex the uh, data management. Uh, how, how do you envision uh, the future in terms of uh, connecting with all these sources of uh, information and also exploiting the capacities of the ecosystem of organizations that are around you that are providers of services or that can help you in exploring this data to, to get profit in terms of uh, value for clinical processes? So uh, maybe Philip and uh, Arnau uh, summarizing a little bit the questions from the floor in terms of governance, consent management, identity management. How, how do you see uh, this evolving in your uh, environment? I, I think, uh, and, and uh, uh, Professor Sherak mentioned very, I think, very clearly and nicely that uh, too many data kill data to some extent. We need to, to limit yes. the amount of data. And that's complicated, you know. If you if you take for example wearables or or or, or smartphone or, or what do you want from patients that are outside of the hospital, the problem is not the technology anymore. The problem is what you do, what you will do with this data. Obviously, you can have algorithm that say, okay, all these parameters, heart rate, blood pressure, weight, whatever, everything is fine. That's within physiological parameter, or we don't do anything. Once you get outside of this range of physiologic parameters, uh, at some point you need human intervention. Maybe you'll need you need a nurse to call the patient, or you need a physician to interfere. Now the, the, that's where you put the limit with that, because you don't, you cannot call every patient, and at the same time, obviously, the, the last thing you want is to have a patient with all these wearables and then dies at home or come half dead to the emergency room because nobody has checked these parameters. And so AI can help to some extent, uh, but that there is a challenge there and, and we'll see how we will move through, through that. Uh, regard, and, and all, come back a little bit to clinical decision support system. I think the, the idea is uh, that most of our medicine is based on on what? On randomized controlled trials, on guidelines, pyramid of evidence. Huh? Pyramid of evidence, level one uh, or level A is uh, RCT, several RCT meta-analysis. 
that most of these RCTs are based on a tiny proportion of eligible patients. I don't know if you realize that, but usually in an RCT, you have only 5% of patients that are included. There are so many exclusion criteria. And then from that, you assume that everybody will answer the same way to a particular drug or an operation or whatever. And I think what CDSs can do is to link the particular data of a patient to what you have in guidelines. And that's where you move from a medicine coming from RCT, which is evidence-based medicine, which is already great, I mean, obviously, to personalized medicine. But there you need, you need a shift. And obviously, that's very complicated because of, of all the data. And also, another source of complication is to change the way physicians think. That's not always easy either. Thank you, Philip. Uh, Arnau, what's your views in, in your case? Yeah, um, for me, the, something that was said that it's kids that it's not only a, a matter of, of data and infrastructure, but an organizational change. And I think uh, that's what we found in, a, in our case. And, and, and we are uh, looking uh, in, in when we provide these uh, new services, uh, this uh, new resources, new people, new profiles that have to uh, take place and also a new way of, of, of doing all the management of this. So it's a, a change in the organization, uh, not only a matter of data and, and infrastructure. Um, and talking to the second topic that, that uh, you asked in terms of uh, governance and interoperability, um, we are, for example, we are now in a, in a consortium with different hospitals from Spain trying to define what would be this uh, common a, a data a, a sharing environment and what would be uh, the standards and there's so many uh, questions and to be answered yet that uh, uh, on on what would be the standard on on the different uh, uh, data origins that they use for example in the EHR mainly uh, just in Catalonia for example we have 27 different EHRs in place uh, from the different hospitals so um, that poses a, a, a really complex ecosystem when talking to uh, having a, a common uh, 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 data. But I think uh, the, the model is by uh, moving towards uh, common standards uh, for interoperability, but also for that uh, organization that could, could help uh, standardize on top of the EHRs and the systems that we have for all these systems. <laughs> Thank you. Now I see the chat is burning. There's many questions. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot go through all of them, but I would like to find a way uh, to have some of the uh, participants in the audience to address some question. We, we see that there is a number of uh, questions related to what is done indeed uh, at the inner in, in the inner circle of the hospital in order to to, to normalize data to. Uh, to to have data, data quality insurance and you have also a strategy to. To, to to bring data coming from and to connect with the external world. So I think it would be I would like to have the views of the the speakers uh, on basically uh, and I put it still in the chat. We see that some hospitals are just now developing EHR uh, for GPs for healthcare professionals in order to create the ecosystem. So what is their strategy? What is their strategy in order to really uh, be part of an ecosystem where they will be able to exploit data in a meaningful way, but not in 25 years time, in the in the, in the short and mid term level. Maybe may, maybe I can jump in. One solution yes, could be to uh, to get the people closer uh, to the data acquisition or IT systems. Um, Arno mentioned uh, the red cap system, for example, which is easy to use for the doctors, I guess, and um, instead of waiting, say, uh, another half a year for some IT person to implement something, we can teach the doctors how to set up the red cap and uh, adapt it to the specific needs of, of the person, and they will quickly see uh, their successes, you know, bec because it's it's set up so easy. So that could be one issue, and, uh, and of course, uh, the whole issue of data literacy. I think it's 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 becoming more and more important and and for all professions I would say it's not just for nurses not just for doctors it's it's for all of them so that they realize that um, um, 
yeah, even validated data might be not the perfect data that you probably need for, say, difficult decisions in, in this regard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, more broadly, the, the, there were several questions and I tried to answer some of them regarding the the, the quality of the data. Obviously, you, you, the, the, what you get in, you get out. Huh? If you get it, the, the data entered is not, it's not high quality. Uh, you you will not so you, you will not get get it out with high quality so you need to have some several validation system it's complicated usually to to have uh, harmonization of, of, of the information that is entered when we started the EHR project back in in 2004 we 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 discussed a lot about trying to implement uh, Bias protocols and also using the same wording. For example, you use you know that the ICD-9 definition of a particular disease, like the coding people do. It's almost impossible because physicians will tell you, and I'm a physician myself, as I said. Well, in that particular case, it's it's not exactly that, but it's that. So I need to be you know it's not a, a standard myocardial infarction because I want to explain that. It's, it's subacute, and in addition, it's only for your wall, but it's an addition on a scar, and, and, and you get that in all disease. And so if you want to limit to a very strict definition, you probably miss the target. I, I hope that NLP will help us there. National language processing will help us to try to dig information out of, uh, of everything that has been entered as free text in, in the medical chart. That's, that's I think, the way I see it. Um, but again, the quality of the data is key. And, and when you get a, a medical department, for example, that's very well organized with a uh, academic type of, of, uh, of hat, which tells this is the way we're going to work. And the, well, it's all, it always work better as opposed to a type where Okay, everybody does what he wants or what her wants. Doesn't mean that the, the quality of care is not good. That's not the problem. The problem is the quality of the data that, that's entered. And, and I think also the training of the data analyst. And I, I tried to answer that in the chat also. Uh, the interaction, the close, close loop interaction between the data analysts and the people that enter the data are very important because then you can make people who enter the data realize that they need to increase to improve this and these particular things. So we, we, we're doing that regularly and we also try to focus more uh, in a few pilot departments now. But is your decision, clinical decision support, support system in this actually based on AI or on uh, rules? I didn't answer it, I said no. Rules. I, I say no, uh, not yet. It, it's only something we started, this clinical decision support system, partly uh, in, in the view of the MRAM-6 and have deployed a little bit, but not as much as I would because of the COVID. What I mentioned is, I think I mentioned that in the, uh, in the chat, uh, we answered a few months ago a call for challenge for, from the EU. Some of you have probably seen that. Uh, and what we propose is, so call for challenge meaning companies answer uh, to develop a cds a system using both discrete and non-discrete data from the medical chart and link them with guidelines but the, so to help physician provide diagnostic and therapeutic decisions at the patient bedside and actually there there was various topics that to propose we proposed that topic and other propose other topics and we got 20 answers 20 companies were interested and so with the help of eu we selected four of them just just actually last week and now we are going to start this uh challenge i mean the, the realistic part of the challenge but it's very interesting to see how cdss is uh is getting a lot of traction but to answer your question we are we do not yet yet have an ai system we are moving to this direction uh, this huge amount of information that we are able to submit to an AI uh, algorithm somehow, a neural network, 
uh, uh, the, the current interest is how, and this is something that uh, I read on the chat, uh, how uh, we as an hospital, we uh, as, uh, as a company are able to uh, certify this as a medical device. And this is a major challenge. Right, because and obviously this call for challenge are, are quite limited uh, because we are to each company that has been selected will receive 70,000 euro. Uh, it's, so basically you pay somebody for a few months, they have six months to do that. And, and we'll see, I think we'll be just a start actually. But it's interesting to see that the EU is, is investing then in the healthcare system. We learned uh, quite a number of things. We know that uh, uh, even if you have a, already you're quite uh, major, you can be uh, level six, you still face many challenges to make that actionable for integrating care and boosting research. So, and there's still much more to be done. Uh, so, indeed for some of you it's a long long pass and people are now getting impatient sometimes but you also know, learn that uh, we have no other choice than being very patient and we know that uh, extending the ecosystem beyond the hospital walls remains challenging uh, for a number of reasons uh, you need to, to agree on governance and uh, on on standards and many many things so uh, once again sharing is something integrating data in order to make them usable for multiple purposes another thing we also learned that uh, uh, data strategies to permit influx from new data sources and gather them together uh, is indeed a need uh, because actually for many use cases the data you have in your hospital or even in a few hospitals are just not enough so you need to connect to uh, the wider world uh, and with quality with with a quality with quality requirements so uh, there are a lot of challenges we know that uh, CD, cdss clinical decision support without good data is not uh, really uh, worse uh, so you cannot uh, as long as you don't have a nice and good and clean data warehouse uh, difficult to to, to have uh, good clinical condition support we know we need we, we learned also that we need that technology uh, helps us to to capture and to normalize data in a more easy way and in a way in a way which is as fluid as possible in order to address more use cases in the future uh, we also uh, learned that we need to select the most fertile, fertile ground and context when we want to use some data reuse. Sometimes it's possible to capture to, to capture a structured data at the point of care. Sometimes not. Sometimes there is a high preserved need for your data. Sometimes you need to take your time to 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 make people understand what it can be done, why it can be done, and uh, and you need to be. Uh, clear about the roles and the interactions. We, for example, you need to find the right data analyst. And, and there was a question in the chat. It seems that it's not easy to find them and to attract them in the hospital and to connect them in the right way with ID, with IT people. And finally, you need to, uh, to gain experience with other European hospitals. And the participation in European project is an excellent opportunity to do that. So with that, we, as I said, we'll have another one on reference architecture in the healthcare domain, using the experience of the large scale pilot, which have had to integrate many different uh, solutions uh, in the, the life cycle of the project. So a bit like the, the uh, Osmart AI project and others, but also uh, for more typical use cases. And we, with this, I just want just to welcome you uh, to join the ATL network if you if you if you're not yet member of uh, of uh, of the ATL uh, association uh, it's it's a, a very friendly club <laughs> friendly club sorry as you can see today and the idea is really to 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 uh, to tr trigger interactions and to uh, to, to support each other in our e-health journey. So, um, as you can see here, there are some advantages uh, if you want to join at this time of the year. So, we welcome to take uh, contact with us if you you are interested. And with this, I think we can close here. And thank you very much. Mm -hmm.